Hello, welcome to this webinar this afternoon. I'm Claudia Joy Wingo. I am the Department Chair of Health Promotion, and we are going to talk a little bit about uh, different profiles in health promotion. So let me just share my screen and get go forward. Okay. I am happy for you to ask any questions as we go along. Uh, you can put them in your in the chat box, or uh, you. I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself. You might not be able to, but you can also put them in the Q and A. So uh, we, I would like to talk to you a little bit today about the Master of Health Promotion. We have an MUIH. We have two areas of concentration, one in community health education and the other in workplace wellness. And so I just wanted to talk to you a little bit today about what health promotion is and uh, what kind of programs uh, the students put together and what our program actually looks like. So, you know, what is health promotion? It really is the science and art of helping people change their lifestyle to move towards a state of optimal health. And so really what you are trying to do is you are trying to put together programs that will help people um, live healthier lifestyles. And you can do that in many different ways. Health promotion comes out of a background of public health. And back in uh, 1986, the World Health Organization um, really uh, kind of created health promotion as its own separate um, profession because it was felt that health education and health promotion is so important um, that it is such a key part of public health that it should have its own uh, space to do the work in. Um, and so, you know, health promotion is partially health education. That's a big part of what health promotion is, but it's, it's a much bigger umbrella. It also is about developing and implementing integrative health programs or public policy. It might be really looking at the prerequisites of health, like um, income or housing or food security, employment, quality working conditions. It may be around, you know, health issues such as you know, vaccination or preventing um, chronic diseases through screening. It could be working with, um, with people around domestic violence. It could be working with people around um, thinking about how to change their behavior so that it works better for them in terms of well-being. So it's a um, it it really is a big umbrella, and a lot of it can be also about advocacy. So this is something I always like to show when I am doing a webinar, and it really is thinking about wellness as a much bigger picture. You know, if you go to the doctor, what happens is usually they are really thinking about your physical wellness and usually you go there maybe for a yearly physical or if you actually get sick um, but do they actually talk to you about you know your motivation or you know stamina that you're having or um, ask about any kinds of um, issues you're having around self-care or sleep um, often it's simply looking at labs and doing your blood pressure and um and, and I will say that some insurance companies now have a, a bit more about self-care and self-help. So that is something that's starting to come to the fore. But usually that's as far as it goes, unless you actually go in and talk to them about your emotional wellness, about depression or anxiety. Um, uh, but most of the time then um, they, they might uh, offer you some coaching, but often it's simply something pharmaceutical. And so, you know, we look at wellness uh, with a much bigger picture. We think about, you know, what um, what does your occupational wellness look like? Do you um, have job satisfaction and career goals? Are you, you know, um, really um, being able to think critically or having goal setting? So intellectual wellness, you know, becoming a lifelong learner, really stimulating your mind. We think about environmental wellness. Do you have a healthy living condition? Do you have 
you know, a neighborhood that you feel like you can walk around in? Um, is there, you know, work being done in your environment around tolerance and diversity? Um, do you have financial wellness? Because it often is the, the base of what you need to have all your other issues uh, taken care of. Do you have social wellness? Um, really, I think during COVID, we've realized how important our social networks are and that we have friends and family to support us. And then finally, spiritual wellness. Do you have time for self-reflection? Do you feel like you have a vision and a purpose? And, uh, and I think that's really key to life satisfaction as well. So, you know, what is health promotion? We talk about health promotion as really considering and addressing health improvements and trying to eliminate um, health disparities as much as possible. And so you really are trying to impact individuals and groups to make positive lifestyle changes and, and make those changes in small but important ways. And that really is key, and it's often hard to do. So, you know, talking about community health, um, when the World Health Organization defines community health as a combination of sciences, skills, and beliefs directed towards the maintenance and improvement of health of all the people through collective and social actions. And so, you know, really this is health that goes out in, into the community and tries to make sure that everyone is taken care of. You know, it really, it, it's, it's not hospital-based or clinic-based um, uh, health. And so uh, it really is truly important when there are so many disparities uh, out there in, uh, in the community. So what do health promoters and health educators do? Um, we teach people about behaviors that promote wellness, and we really try to develop and help people implement strategies that are going to improve the health of individuals and communities. Um, you're often going into a community and finding out what that community needs from people in the community. Usually you're going straight to the leaders in those communities because they know best of, about what is needed. We tend to work in a variety of settings. It could be hospitals or public health departments. It could be local, state, or federal government. It might be in you know, health insurance companies. It could be in the workplace or in nonprofit organizations, private businesses, or, um, or schools or colleges. Uh, so there's lots of different places that you can make an impact. So we say that uh, as a health education specialist, you do many different things. So you are kind of providing information and education about effects of poor behavior choices, um, what that might have, how that it might impact people's health, and um, really trying to empower people so that they feel whole, resourceful, and capable of change. So giving them tools uh, so they know how to make those health behavior changes. Um, and so you do that by creating and implementing preventative healthcare programs and assessments as well. And so you're really um, trying to kind of design learning experiences for specific communities uh, that will resonate with those communities and ensure that they're culturally appropriate and, and relevant and, and that they work. So um, this is from the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, and um, this job outlook uh, goes up to 2028, uh, and we uh, it's about 11% faster than average. So there's actually quite a lot of jobs out there, um, and the median average wage, it's really anywhere from, and actually it's gone up a little bit uh, during COVID, about sixty-five dollars to $85,000 a year, depending on where you get the job. And you'll see here that there are a number of different places you can work. This is, you know, state, federal government uh, and non-governmental organizations or nonprofits, hospitals, individual family services, local government, outpatients and universities, schools and uh, professional schools. So one uh, thing that we do do uh, here at MUIH within our program is that we really prep you 
to be able to sit for the CHES exam, and that is to become a certified health education specialist. And uh, really, uh, it is a gold standard in the field, and we really prep you in the last two trimesters. We um, give you study materials. We uh, the 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 program is actually based around the the areas of um, responsibility and the competencies of uh, of Ches and of the National Commission for Health Education Credentialing, and so um, we have a test exam uh, and. Um, we have study groups as well. So we feel like you, we really prime you to be able to sit um, for the program. And, and it's, it's absolutely worth having because being um, a certified health education specialist gives you kind of a head up in the field. People know that you have done training and have been tested on that training to be able to work out in the world as a health educator and health coordinator um, promoting pub, um, public health. So we always, I always put in all the different uh, titles that you might look uh, for if you go out there looking for a job. Um, and there, there certainly are a lot of jobs out there uh, in many different um, kind of fields. And we're gonna look at some of the programs that students have done out there in the, in the world. In, that, in the wide world. So let's look a little bit at what the program looks like. It is a, um, a 35 credit master's degree that can be completed in six trimesters. And um, it is all online. And as I said, there's two areas of concentration and you can sit for CHES no matter which one you do. And we also have very innovative uh, coursework that uh, really includes things like mindfulness and movement, integrative and functional nutrition, herbal medicine, and healing presence. So it's um, things that you probably will not get anywhere else. So, you know, in community health, you are focusing on uh, sp uh, specific groups, health challenges and needs. It could be working with youth or the elderly or specific ethnic groups or people that have specific chronic diseases or um, are having other different kinds of challenges in their life. Uh, you might be working with um, new mothers around breastfeeding or uh, women uh, dealing with domestic violence. You might be working with you know, refugees or a specific um, groups of people. Uh, or you might be working in a school or university, uh, talking to students and really helping them, you know, start working on uh, their health in a way that will lead to lifelong patterns. Um, when the, in the workplace wellness AOC, you, you see that in a lot of um, workplaces, uh, HR is hiring people that have expertise in this area. And so you are kind of assessing employees' needs and risks and then putting together innovative programs that will support and uh, facilitate behavior change. And, you know, I think that um, the one thing that we find about workplace wellness, uh, particularly during COVID, is that um, a lot of programs have been put in place to support people and um, they have been predominantly online. Um, but I think um, that also people are going back to work and it's, I think it's been realized how important workplace wellness is and how uh, embedded these programs need to be in the workplace. So this is what the, the program looks like. It's 23 core credits and then 12 um, credits for each AOC. And uh, so this is really what it looks like. Uh, you do a couple of um, of of courses that are survey courses, one on the fundamentals of health education and health behavior and another on complementary health approaches. Then you do communication strategies and a diversity course, then a needs assessment and program planning and a course in uh, research methods, really it's epidemiology. And then learning how to evaluate your programs uh, along with an elective and then you really uh, start to put together your own program in the implementation courses uh, along with an elective. And finally, you do a capstone course uh, and a leadership administration and management course. 
And, you know, in the implementation and capstone, you actually uh, put together your own program for beginning to end. It's one way that we weave everything together because you use all the information that you've gotten in the, the year and a, and a half previously. You will also see that we never have more than um, six credits per trimester, and we find that that works um, just enough that... Uh, that you can do that without, uh, with while you're working or uh, living your own life. Here are uh, some of the electives: uh, nutrition, physical activity, mindfulness, um, health systems, macro to micro, uh, being a healing presence, fundamentals of herbal medicine, and integrative care models. We also have uh, a couple of courses about uh, Ayurveda as well. And so we're pretty flexible with the electives. If uh, you decided you wanted to do two in nutrition or two in herbal medicine um, that, or two in Ayurveda, then you could do that and have a bit of specialty. So um, are there any prerequisites for the program? No, there really aren't, um, except for you have to have an undergrad. So you need to have a bachelor's degree, but other than that, there aren't any prerequisites. Um, you can get a student loan. The loading for a student loan is at least three credits a trimester. And, uh, and so we make sure that you have that. You don't have to finish in two years, although um, it's pretty hard to push it past three, uh, but you actually have five years to finish the program. Uh, sometimes people have to take a trimester, uh, a leave of absence for a trimester, and, um, and that is also possible. There are specific plans of study uh, because some of the uh, courses don't run every trimester. And so we uh, have a specific uh, one for two years and for three years. And if you change that, we ask that you get in touch with either me as a department chair or the your academic advisor or both so that we know uh, what we might need to kind of fiddle with your schedule. The courses, the three credit courses are 14 weeks long, two credit or 10 weeks long. And um, we do feel like you will be well prepared for the CHES exam. We make, uh, we make sure that you are. What's involved in the capstone? Uh, the capstone has um, 10 hours of practicum. And we uh, we like you to uh, go out into the community or the workplace and run a portion of the program you're putting together. Um, and that can be done in the evenings. It can be, be done on the weekend. Um, it can be done online or in person. Um, and so again, we're very flexible about that. We like you to get some experience in the field so you know what it's about. And uh, if you can't find a way to put together uh, and run part of your program, we also have opportunities um, that we provide at MUIH. So um, we are going to look at some of the career opportunities and where others have done their practicums and gone on to work. So you have some kind of an idea. And we do say that, um, that it's such a diverse field to really have to just think about what you're interested in. So this was a, um, a program that one of our students put together and ran, and it's, um, it's in Cleveland, Ohio. It's a health scholars internship program, um, and it's a five-year year-round program that gives uh, students learning and experience uh, through the school year for um, minority students in junior high and high school to see what it's like um, to think about a career in medicine. It's a four-week intensive program at a university hospital in Cleveland, and it gives these students a chance to look at the health professionals and do some career ex uh, exploration, and uh, they have a number of special programs and tours and educational field trips. And uh, one of the things that uh, this student did was she did, uh, she's a music therapist, and so she worked with students um, uh, around mindfulness by using music. And so this was uh, really what her, uh, her program looked like. She had a number of different sessions and they looked at um, using music as uh, a mindful meditation. And so they used um, three different kinds of music. 
and they thought about their first impressions, musical elements, and the emotion, and anything they noticed within themselves. Very popular program, and the students loved it, and the, the uh, instructor loved it as well. This was a program put together by one of our students who works in the school system called Lead the Whole Teacher to Support the Whole Child. And what she really wanted to do was to implement this program, um, really starting with the, the leaders in the school and then the teachers, uh, and then they could pass it on to the students. Um, and, you know, it, they, we thought it was so important because the teachers um, are really very stressed. They just don't have enough time to complete all their work. And this has really been exacerbated during COVID as well. They're really stressed all the time. Um, there's really this new push in education for social emotional learning. And so she uh, put together a template of the program using that uh, framework. And so her target audience was really starting at the elementary level with um, the leaders, uh, you know, um, middle, uh, first elementary school principals, assistant principals and school leaders, and then working up through middle school and high school. This is, is in Maryland. And uh, she used a number of different time, uh, management strategies. These are things that you will learn within the program tiny habits, breathing techniques, mindfulness, and mindful moments. And then also uh, did classes in self-care yoga, walking meetings, and healthier eating habits. And she also did them at different times of uh, the, the day and the week so that, um, that people could join when they had time. And also looked at this school schoolology course for collaboration, community, and accountability, and did assessments. This was a program that one of the students did in prison and she was a yoga teacher and she felt like yoga and meditation really had um, the power to transform lives and that it would be a great place to run some classes. And she did an eight week uh, program within uh, the prison environment, um, two hours. They did, um, they did some stretching, um, then yoga, and then visualizations, and uh, and meditation. And they also did things around health behavior and decisions and the opportunity to be leaders within the class. And uh, what she found was uh, it, there weren't many people in the first week, uh, but by the fourth week, uh, they had to find a bigger room. And by the seventh week, a couple of guards came in and did it. And uh, and so it really helped over those eight weeks. Uh, she left and a month later they called her back and now she actually runs two programs there, one for the guards and uh, one for the, uh, the people that are incarcerated. So, you know, obviously a place that really needs that sort of thing. This was a program uh, that a student did with, um, with, the, with the health department of Tulsa. Uh, Oklahoma, and she worked in an Oklahoma public school with kindergarten through third grade to really uh, kind of empower students to make healthy choices around food when they're young. Um, and so she uh, she put together a program that was based on USDA approved nutrition and exercise. And um, they put together weekly classes and then at the end of the year had a nutrition fair uh, brought in the, the physical education and health teacher, the cafeteria management, and a couple of parents to help. And uh, ultimately, she was hired by the public health department to run school programs. So often uh, from your practicum, you get a job. Um, this was uh, a program that a, a woman who was a nurse uh, put together a home-based ca uh, cardiopulmonary rehab program. Um, and she had found that there were uh, other programs out there. And so she looked at the template and actually uh, kind of uh, tailored it for her patients because she worked at the Veterans Administration Hospital. And um, again, it was the perfect time to do it during COVID. And so really looking at monitoring uh, their exercise, you know, over Zoom, doing motivational uh, interviewing and, um, and coaching and being an educator to them. And um, 
So she did a survey, she did consults, uh, she did a lot of work on this and it was uh, well recognized by the hospital. This is an interesting one. This was a woman who did a workplace wellness program for uh, a company um, that does CBD products. Um, and uh, again, she's been hired by the company uh, once she finished her practicum. So it's a startup company, skincare um, in Aspen, Colorado, and they uh, they use CBD uh, in their in their skincare. And so she the company was a startup, so they really didn't have any wellness programs. So she actually put together a wellness program for them. Uh, and, you know, they they only had um, some health insurance and paid time off so she can really start at the bottom and work up. And so her motives were she had known the woman who run the company, but and she really felt like their core values was something that she identified with. Um, and she was very much interested in, um, in CBD and, and skin care. And so what she did was obviously in a stress, it was a startup. Uh, and so they, uh, she put together a, a workplace wellness program that, that really looked at de-stressing. So they did a, uh, a weekly wellness Wednesday text messages every Wednesday. They did, uh, she sent out a wellness box and then she did a monthly Zoom uh, serving as a virtual water cooler and taught them how to use all the things that were in their monthly wellness boxes. It went over really well. And obviously it did because they hired her. This, um, this was a program that somebody did that worked for Metro uh, in HR. And uh, she did a four week program uh, and put it, put it together with the safety meetings. Um, short, but, but but it had to be um, 20 minutes and really highlighted the benefits of mindfulness and tried to uh, kind of break down barriers. So the target group was bus operators in D.C. with average age around 47. Most of them were African-American and high stress job. And she had a really great communication strategy where she put out custom uh, promotional materials um, she had flyers and text messages and emails and put together short promotional videos for the break room monitors and really targeted, you know, stress management, increased resilience and building small habits to adopt a preventive approach. So they, you know, did some things like stop and breathe. So if you have a stressful encounter with somebody getting on the bus or, you know, there's a lot of traffic, you could focus on your breath, uh, even though you were sitting in the driver's seat. Also did a stress ball toss uh, when they had a break and um, and uh, a little video on why, why, why mindfulness is a superpower. This was a program that was put together for MUIH and uh, it's running now. And a couple of my students put it together and then we put it into action at the university itself. And uh, we ended up, we did it as a pilot program face-to-face -face, uh, and wrote it up and, uh, and presented it at several conferences. And then we did it uh, as an online program. And now uh, and that was also a pilot. Now we're implementing it as a university-wide program. This was um, a program that we did with Community Action Council, Howard County. And um, we helped with their Head Start program, and we also did their family engagement nights. And we brought um, both nutrition and uh, health promotion and coaching students together. And uh, we did we had games for the kids, and we had educational classes for the adults. Uh, and we always gave them a, a, we did cooking classes and gave them food to eat there. Uh, we had family style meals and gave them food to take home as well. There's some of the students uh, with their crock pot chili recipes, both vegetarian and turkey. Um, this was an interesting program. It was one that someone put together to really work with uh, caregivers. And so it was called two-way care and really kind of making sure that caregivers had uh, were able to balance their own life. So um, it looked at first assessing the caregivers and seeing you know, where they were right then and what their 
kind of hobbies were and the life before caregiving, then building community with, that, uh, with others that were caregivers and um, finding ways to, um, to help each other and to also help themselves, exercise and meditation, healthy eating, a little bit of time away from caring to look after themselves, and then some one-on-ones uh, and self-work to help them continue on that journey. Um, this was a lunch and learn that uh, students did for Humana. And um, they had four to 600 people in each, <laughs> each lunch and learn, which made them a bit nervous, but really went off very well. So it was a four part series and we covered a number of different subjects with the graduate students interviewing the experts. And uh, as I said, uh, attended by four to 600 employees and could be accessed by all 50,000 employees. Um, and this was one of the students that did it uh, and interviewed Diane Finlayson, who was the department chair of yoga therapy. And uh, and it, it worked out really well. The the uh, employees really loved it. And they, they you know, it was an hour long. Stress management for small businesses. This was a program that one of the students put together and looked at uh, running workplace wellness programs for small businesses because they often didn't have programs and really looked at, you know, workplace culture, tailored it for small businesses and thought about stress management jobs. So that's it. So um, I hope that you enjoyed this and that you found uh, it to be interesting. Um, if you're interested in um, in starting an application, we have an informal spring intake uh, as well as a formalized fall intake. You can get uh, in touch with us uh, and you can do that via admissions at muih.edu or directly to me as the department chair. Uh, my email is easy. It's cwingo, that's wingo like bingo with a W at muih.edu. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming today. And, uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to be in touch.